Hello, everyone. My name is Joran, and I'm a senior student here at the Village Zendo. Uh, so until this morning, I thought I'd be at the Zendo in person this evening. Um, so much so that I actually left my Rakasu there. Um, but we made a last minute switch to an online format. So I was looking forward to being in the Zendo, um, but I realized in terms of giving a talk back in the Zendo, for some reason, I was a little nervous about it. I realized there's uh, something a bit protective about being on Zoom. Um, I'm feeling all the habits that have been changed and softened from the two years of participating in practice on Zoom, including giving a few talks from home uh, with a carefully arranged background, trying to get the light right, a bit more control. So in the end, here I am back in the Zoom container. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, being online with the Zendo is very much being here online together. But it's also not being here physically with the trade-off of the flow of liturgy and all the synchronization between people moving around in the Zendo and the shared temple space. So one thing I'm gonna talk about is face-to-face -face presence. Uh, so as many of you know, I am a parent of a teenager with my partner. Um, our child was 12 when the pandemic forced everyone online, and they're now 14. They've also developed some different habits. I will refrain from calling them bad habits, just the euphemistic different habits during this time. Part of what's happened during their early adolescent years impacted by the pandemic has been a tendency towards flattening, binaristic, on off presence absence of their physical and social sphere. Now back in school again in person, uh, many of the peripheral interactions with, with others have had to be relearned this past year. Having the necessary tools to interact in a classroom was not a given when they went back to school in person last fall. In online school during the pandemic, opting out was easy. Turning the camera off in class, skipping extracurriculars, spending whole weekends inside at home. The option not to participate was way more powerful during the quarantine times with the ever present distractions of the screen that represented all school and social life. So now that we've been back to something like normal, it's taken a lot for our kid to come to terms with the world again in person. On some level, part of their development has taken place asleep and the awakening has felt very rude much of the time. They are out of practice with being open to the physical world, out of touch with the Sangha of their peers. Um, so while some of these problems have been experienced by uh, a lot of us during this time, I realize that on some level, these past two plus years have actually really been very connected for me. So I'm at the other end of the developmental arc uh, here, well past mid-century. And I've had the experience of really zooming in during the pandemic. Uh, although teaching online sucked and dealing with conflict in my job uh, among colleagues has been hard, but the online Zendo has been a lifeline, a rare kind of connection. So in this talk, I want to explore, oops, <laughs> 
I want to explore the paradigm of connecting and not connecting, being face to face, physically or not. As a way to explore this, I will bring in the koan from the Book of Serenity, Lin Ji's True Man. Um, one aside, in this case, I found it awkward to replace the true man with a less gendered, differently gendered term and pronouns. So I will count on each of you to interpret accordingly. The koan. Linji said to the assembly, there is a true man without rank, always going out and in through the portals of your face. Beginners who have not yet witnessed this, look, look. A monk came forward and said, what is the true man of no rank? Linji got down from the seat, grabbed and held him. The monk hesitated. Linji pushed him away and said, the true man of no rank, what a piece of dry crap he is. So, <coughs> so there is in this koan, the <coughs> stunning, the stunning image of the, the true man of no rank going out and in through the portals of your face this kind of immaterial look, countenance, face that we all have. And it's kind of just an amazing image to contemplate. But what strikes me next about this koan is the monk's hesitation. I identify with it, of course. In talking about the challenge of being face to face, whether physically present or contained in the Zoom window, when called upon to speak, when called upon to speak the truth, I may well hesitate. The monk was at a loss for words. Uh, we can speculate about what was going on with the monk as Linji was challenging the monk to be present here and now and demonstrate their understanding. Um, maybe the monk was burnt out. Maybe the monk had too many demands on their shoulders. Maybe the monk was filled with anxiety. Maybe the monk had promised to make dinner then realized there were no onions and they had to go shopping first and it was getting late. Maybe the monk was distracted, overthinking things. Maybe the monk was in an impossible position, frozen, paralyzed, overwhelmed. Maybe they were looking for something more holy, more exalted to say, looking for validation from the teacher. Maybe the monk was sick. And maybe the monk was sad. Equally striking as the monk's hesitation is the fact of Linji grabbing and holding the monk. The monk's hesitation takes place inside of Linji's embrace. Inside of Linji's embrace is the teaching that the true man of no rank is always going out and in through the portals of your face. It's what's happening. It's what is possible. Can you see it? This embrace is a moment of relationship in which there's the potential for the true man of no rank to be seen, to be seen as joyful, as angry, as dry crap, as holiness, as hilarious, as infinitely sad. Although the monk has it, they can't see it, the true human without rank. So I'm interested, to say the least, 
in this idea of Linji's embrace as an intensified opportunity for seeing it, for speaking from the heart. And there are many such opportunities in our practice. Interview with the Roshis and teachers, open sozong, dharma combat, uh, these face-to-face -face opportunities for speaking from the heart can feel intense and challenging, I find. Uh, preparing for a Dharma talk is a grabbing and holding. Yep, I've been wrestling with Linji for the past week or two, hesitating like mad, not seeing it and experiencing the piece of dry crap. We have many opportunities for intensified face-to-face -face expression that are like Linji's confrontation with the monk. So, well, online life has been debil debilitating for the physical lives of teenagers, those very physical beings during the past two years, along with all the many reasons for skyrocketing anxiety levels among children and teenagers in these times. I feel inversely that for me, the Zoom screen has provided a window for face-to-face -face expression where the obstacles to physical presence have at times fallen away, allowing connection to become more focused. In a few days, we will hold the memorial service for Yuka, our beloved Sangha member and friend who passed away nearly 49 days ago. For me, Yuka grabbed and held the Sangha in many ways in the last two years in the process of her dying offering so many opportunities for the kind of intensified face-to-face -face true expression that Linji so lovingly offers the monk. This grabbing and holding took place on Zoom often through email and on rare occasions in person. But her generous openness with the process of her own dying has been a powerful and intimate experience that she shared with us. Yuka has always had a way of fearlessly confronting hesitation. For me, a few specifics stand out. She was specifically fierce around the koan of parenting and living fully as a female identified human. Equally fierce around the koan of taking responsibility for having access to white privilege in a racist society. And fierce in fully exploring and, uh, and having inquiring into face to face expression through performance, creative expression, having a voice losing a voice, making a voice out of no voice, creative and literally, as she asked others to voice her Dharma talk when her voice faltered. Yuka opened rigorous spaces of inquiry around these points of hesitation and expression. So this koan, Linji's True Man, includes a verse by Jian Dong. Delusion and enlightenment are opposite, subtly communicated with simplicity. Spring opens the hundred flowers in one puff. Power pulls back nine bulls in one yank. It's hopeless. The mud and sand can't be cleared away, clearly blocking off the eye of the sweet spring. If suddenly it burst forth, it would freely flow. The mud and the sand can't be cleared away. It's actually kind of grounding this line because it's so true. We hesitate endlessly. I hesitate endlessly. 
In the summer of 2020, I was overwhelmed and not looking to help organize a group. But Yuka made it clear that we could all benefit from having a place to explore whiteness in the village Zendo. Um, so maybe the hesitating monk was lost in coming to terms with their own racism, white privilege, speechless, voiceless, vacant, alienated from themselves. I can certainly experience this self-alienation, being fully lost to myself, whether it's guilt and shame, judgment, confusion, distraction, realizing my own conditioning, realizing that I am occupied. I'm unconsciously identified with oppressive systems. This can shut me right up, this realization. I definitely would rather not talk about it. It's in this preference to not talk about it that I inhabit the piece of dry crab. Yuka's firm embrace allowed participants in the White Work on Racism group to encounter the dry crap of white supremacy as it flows out and in through the portals of our faces. Uh, Yuka always asked me and Kyogen for ideas in the planning of each group and drew abundantly on Kyogen's experiences and leadership with Surge but she always also had a plan in mind to keep the flow going. Strict timing of the script, going from facing our complicity through readings, exercises, and breakouts to listening and moving together, confrontation and healing, creating the container for that practice so delicately. You could devise this space of embrace and hesitation and the opportunity to stay with this hesitation fully, the dry crap, not just stepping away from it, but dwelling inside of it and coming to the juiciness of saying it subtly and directly. And uh, Yuka has always said it directly when it comes to kids and parenting. An adoring parent of an incredible adult daughter, yet Yuka has not hesitated at certain moments to express moments of rage, trading off parts of oneself in the process, the resentment about parenting in a society that blames parents, particularly mothers, for the perceived shortcomings or problems behavior of their children. I learned at the Shiva for Yuka that she had made a video piece while raising her daughter entitled Martyred Moms. Equal parts whimsical humor, brilliant insight, warm connection and trenchant anger have been part of Yuka's unhesitating saying it. Uh, for this true expression, I am profoundly grateful clearing away mud and sand, blocking the eye of sweet spring, it suddenly bursts forth, freely flowing. Uh, one time I arrived at a Zoom group with Yuka quite late, having gotten the time wrong, and I burst in during someone else's rather intimate sharing. I was out of breath and babbling excuses, totally out of sync with what was happening in the group. And Yuka let me know that this was a deep disruption of the group in no uncertain terms, pushing me away, waking me up. It was real. In that moment, the true human was a piece of dry crap. And another time, spring opens the hundred flowers in one puff. Returning to the teenager and the Zoom screen and returning to myself and my hopes for my creative projects in the slim window of this summer. Will I be able to see it? How tight does the embrace need to be in order to see the separate self and other as one in this moment? How to say what I have to say to you how can I clear away the hesitation, the mud and sand, and let the eye of the sweet spring flow? 
making you laugh, cry, see me, lose me, force me to express what I don't know that I know. How can I grab and hold you? How can you grab and hold me? This past Saturday, uh, we made a last minute decision to book a seaside hotel room in Long Beach on Long Island. And we wrestled our kid into the car for exactly 30 hours away out of the apartment. And they were cheerful for a little while, but it didn't take long to revert to wishing they could be with their friends and back at home with their various devices. They were sulking and not leaving the hotel room despite being at the beach and declaring mental health breakdown. While we concentrated on enjoying the uh, on enjoying the beautiful setting ourselves, we managed to pry them out of the room for a short walk on the beach and also for a bike ride on the boardwalk after checkout before getting back in the car. Then suddenly during the hour long ride home, looking up from their phone, they began what they call a rant. Discoursing about death and consciousness. They talked about how they can come to terms with death and the loss of someone, um, including the loss of people in their family they experienced during the pandemic by thinking about the joy that other people somewhere else experience at the birth of a child. The sense of that life continues after death in this continual rebirth. They talked about death and what happens to consciousness when you die and how scientists have proved that after you die, nothing remains. Death is absolute. They talked about artificial intelligence and the effort to reconstitute human consciousness. I don't really know where all this came from. Various scenarios of the transfer of consciousness from a dying body to a new body. They went on and on, requesting to resume after brief interruptions, exploring their thinking about how we die and we don't die. Uh, and there in the tight embrace of the car ride home, clearly the eye of sweet spring was unblocked, suddenly bursting forth and flowing freely. We had a moment of family connection that was not at all guaranteed, given how things had been going. Lindsay's true man jumps out in a moment of shocking embrace, grabbing and holding with relationship as the catalyst. Mourning and joy and the joy of speaking and listening come together in a lightning bolt. The piece of dry crap is there unhesitatingly, along with the sudden beauty of seeing ourselves and each other face to face. 